Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. It is 6.32, so to be respectful of your time, we're going to get started. Uh, we have uh, quite a few more attendees that will probably hop on. Um, my name is Lauren Linney, or I'm Boland, and I work for Santa Clara County Fire Department. I'm a community risk specialist in our community education and risk reduction services. With us today, we have Cap uh, we have Curtis Ruel, who's a senior deputy fire marshal, and we have Battalion Chief Phil Yanoni. And we're going to be uh, the instructors for tonight's class of reducing wildfire risks in the home ignition zone. So before we get started, uh, Chief Yanoni, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. And thanks for having me. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's always encouraging to see so many folks uh, join on and want to learn about the things that you can do to make yourself and your home safer. As Lauren said, my name is Phil Yanoni. I'm a battalion chief here with Santa Clara County Fire Department. I'm actually one of three battalion chiefs that are on every day that cover a span of 15 stations. So each battalion chief is kind of responsible for a handful of stations. And we mostly work on the operational side, meaning when the bell goes off for 911, that's what we respond to. However, we also work hand in hand with fire prevention. And you'll see a lot of that take place tonight as we discuss um, the different things that you do to can stay safe. So uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, we hope you guys enjoy and learn as much as you can from us tonight. Thank you so much, Chief. Thank you for being here. And then we have Senior Deputy Fire Marshal Curtis Ruel. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Lauren said, my name is Curtis. I supervise the handful of Deputy Fire Marshals that go out into our communities throughout the west side of the valley and conduct uh, WUI inspections or hazard ignition zone inspections, either through enforcement or as a courtesy. Uh, we work closely with the operation staff and the community education staff uh, to really kind of have an overall good, robust program. Hopefully, you all learned something good tonight, and uh, feel free to ask us any questions if you have them. Appreciate it. Awesome. And we also have a senior community risk specialist, Gina Kelly. She will be managing the chat today. We're going to be putting a lot of information that we're going to be covering today in that chat with links. So please feel free to click on those links as they come out. If you don't click on them, don't worry. At the end of this program, we're going to be sending out a Dropbox link to all of the attendees. And that Dropbox link is going to have not only will it have handouts that we're going to be discussing, it'll also have the uh, chat notes as well, uh, the links that were in the chat notes. So if you can't get all the information right away, don't worry, we're gonna be sending it all to you. Um, so we're gonna get started, just jump right into it. This is a really robust program. It's gonna cover a lot of information. We're just gonna take it step by step and talk our way through it. Okay. okay. And Lauren, would you like to cover the agenda items or would you like me to get Absolutely. started? I can, I can definitely cover the agenda items. So the main things that we're going to be talking about today, uh, the first section, we're going to be talking about embers and how they contribute to structure ignition. We're going to talk about the home ignition zone and what that home ignition zone is. We're going to do talk about home ignition zone assessments. And then we're also going to be talking about hardening the home within the home ignition zone. And we're going to probably be referring to the home ignition zone as HIS. It's just a quicker acronym. Um, but we're going to be talking about the, interme uh, the immediate, intermediate, and extended zone. The bulk of this class is going to be focusing on that immediate zone one. So the structure itself and that zero to five. But we will be touching upon the intermediate and extended zones as well. Perfect. Yeah, and I think you're going to hear terms throughout the this evening here, and I just want you to know we're going to circle back on a lot of those those terms and break them down for you. So, but as Curtis said, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So, one of the very first agenda items that you saw there is um, talking about embers and how they contribute to structure ignition. In other words, what what role do they play in actually starting fires? Well, the first thing I think it's important to ask is, well, what is an ember? Okay, it's different from ash. Okay, ash is that powdery, broken down residual stuff that you see at the bottom of your fireplace or after a campfire. It's after it's been completely burned through and it, all the fuel has been taken out of it. An ember is a little bit different. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit lighter. It's only partially burned, if that makes sense. And it still has a lot of usable chemical energy in it. So the embers um, can travel far and they can settle down and they can burn for quite a long time. And that's what they're talking about as far as them becoming products of things that can help start a fire. So um, as you can see, they're small, they glow, they're superheated. 
um, and they, they, they tend to find um, very creative places to hide out and kind of uh, nestle down and, and smolder for a while before getting a little bit of oxygen and reigniting and starting up um, other fires. They travel far in the wind um, with these intense fires that you see. And interestingly enough, they can travel up to a mile away ahead of the fire and help start some of these fires. So that's where, when we talk about embers and ember showers or casts, that's what we're speaking of. Okay. I think we have a quick video too that shows a little bit of that. All companies on righteous divisions be advised, fire's coming. Most people think wildfires are to blame for the destruction of homes and property. But in reality, in many cases, the culprits are the embers that are carried by the wind ahead of the real fire. Uh, we got some stuff back up here, some embers and glows, and landed on that roof right there. It's starting on fire. Amber showers are an undeniable threat during any wildfire, big or small. They can travel for miles to homes where they find small spaces around and inside of buildings, hiding and smoldering for hours, even days before bursting into flames. You can see the black smoke and the fire is spreading. They could hide in a wood pile behind a trash can, hunker down in the debris on your roof or in the gutters. It takes just one ember to bring a wildfire to your home, to your family. Learn about defensible space. Go to nfpa.org and click on Firewise USA. It's erratic winds and erratic fire behavior. Be ready. It's not a question of if, but when. Okay, and that's a very powerful uh, quick video there that really kind of shows you the devastation that these embers can uh, can bring along with them. So, um, you know, I don't want that to be too overwhelming for you. There's things that we can do um, to help, uh, you know, prepare yourself for when these embers kind of come to affect your house. But I just find it very interesting, all the different areas and the different ways that they talk about those embers can nestle down and where they, all the creative ways that they have of finding their way into your house and then it all can take place within a day or two afterwards. So even after the fire's passed, those embers can still be there and reignite at a later time. So um, it's, it's, it's something super important that we're, we're gonna talk a lot about. I do think that the third bullet point here at the slide is very important. And it talks about embers igniting components of vulnerable structures. And I just wanted to touch upon that. I think what's, what we're talking about there is that they're speaking of those homes that are for all intents and purposes, un, unmaintained, or the vegetation around the structure or the property is unmanicured. Um, those become very vulnerable. Those are very susceptible to these wildfires that we're speaking about. So we're gonna talk a lot about the things that we can do to help prevent that. Um, as a first responder coming into these fires, if it's a slow moving fire up against the house, <clears throat> We can take care of that. We can line out our fire apparatus along those structures and we can protect and bounce the fire around the house. But it's very difficult to do if we're behind the eight ball, if you will, and there's a lot of work to be done at that house that maybe hasn't been maintained or the vegetation hasn't been manicured. So we really need to be aware of what those things that we call vulnerable structures. And you're gonna learn a lot about the things that you can do to make sure that your, your house and your home's not, not one of those. It's a very interesting picture right here. If you look at the one to the left, at first glance, you'd think, well, how, how could that house possibly have caught on fire? Look at all that green vegetation around it. Well, a couple things here could happen. This could have been a victim of ember casts, embers that have traveled, like we said, up to a mile away, maybe landed in one of the roof gutters that had pine needles, maybe got landed on a roof that was an old wood sh shake roof, perhaps. Um, or it, in a sense, it's kind of hard to tell, but this one also could have been a ground fire that moved along the ground on the surface fuels and caught the house on fire. But again, if you look at that house that was there at one time, you'd think it would have been, um, it'd be questionable as to how it caught fire. Same with the one on the right. So I think pictures really can um, drive home the, 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 the thought here. So those are good pictures. 
So what are we going to do? I know we do as first responders, but this is the part of the program where we kind of want to put it back on you and assist you to help take some actions to help protect you, your property and your house. And we're talking about these homes that sit right there within that wild urban urban interface area. And it's not the, the wildfire is not so much the problem. It's the structure ignition that we that we see take place that is kind of the problem. And again, we're going to break down these different homes or these different zones um, and, and teach you different things that you do can kind of stay safe. So it's a good video, a good picture right there. <clears throat> So what is a home ignition zone? Um, well, they're broken down in three different zones. And these are zones that have been kind of created by some of the, uh, the, the fire scientists or the research personnel um, that have done lots of studies and help kind of come up with these different zones. There's three major ones. Lauren briefly talked about them. And I'm actually only gonna briefly talk about them too because we're gonna really dive into them throughout the video. But the first is an immediate zone. And that's anything from your house to five feet out. And then we have the intermediate zone, that's zone two, and that's five feet out to 30. And you start getting the landscape and some of your vegetation. And then there's the extended zone, 30 to 100 feet out. All equally important, and we're going to break each one down um, as far as what you can do as a homeowner to help protect your house. Uh, it's a super important part of um, maintaining your house and keeping your house safe. And like I said, each zone is, I think, equally important. We'll go through them all. Um, so those are the zones, but we also have a home ignition zone assessment. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that entails. <clears throat> These are the things that you can do, again, to kind of help keep your, your, your house safe. And you wanna, you wanna break it down. Uh, the bullet points there, I think, are really good guidelines. And you have to start with, you know, what is it that I'm actually trying to assess? Well, it's the house or the houses or whatever structures you may have on your home. Um, and then you want to make sure that you are um, taking the right steps to, I guess, mitigate those issues that are in within each one of those zones. We do have a contact number um, on our website, and it's actually here on the PowerPoint too, um, that you can call as a resource for uh, so some additional um, advice or recommendations, if you will. And we also have on our uh, website, correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren, a quick video there from Jack Cohen. Yep, he shows it right there. Very good, very short video, but really breaks down the things that you can do to kind of help keep your house safe. He is a retired U.S. National Forest fire researcher, and uh, he has a lot of really good advice there. And that you can, again, find that on our, our website right there. Okay. Good. Some things to really keep in mind when you're doing your home assessment. It's one thing to look at each of those zones and the things that are in them, but there's other factors that come in that you need to make sure you are assessing. Um, do you live in an area where there are on a regular basis, severe winds. Um, what are the weather patterns in the areas that you live in? If there is any type of forest fire or vegetation fire, is your house susceptible to catching those embers? Where does your house sit in relationship to the wildfires that are coming? Does it sit at the top of a hill? We call those shoots or chimneys, beautiful views, but oftentimes highly exposed to uh, vegetation and wildland fires. And then being aware of the ember and flame cast from the nearby structures that could catch on fire that could also bring embers back onto your property. So it's not only the things at your house, but it's the surrounding area with where your house is as well, equally important. All right, thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. So most of the information and recommendations that we're gonna be making today are from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety or IBHS. I'll be referring to IBHS a lot. And many of the recommendations, um, the IBHS is an independent nonprofit scientific research and communications organization supported solely by property insurers and reinsurers. And IBHS's research helps communities become more resilient to natural disasters. And I'll briefly go over just some of the websites and there, Gina will be placing these websites in the chat as well. So this is IBHS's main website and they have some really great information. You can click wildfire, they have wind 
um, wind uh, events and earthquakes and floods, but it just has some really good information. And then there's also their other website. This is also an IBHS website, the disastersafety.org. This website has so much information. I have spent so much time researching stuff on here, and it is all fantastic information for you to go through. We'll just quickly click on the wildfire um, section. And I mean, it has everything. What to do if a wildfire is approaching your home, weekend wildfire preparedness tips that you can do, and the regional wildfire retrofit guide. So this guide is what we based this course off of. This is our course is a very much abbreviated version of this uh, wildfire guide. And you will be getting that in the Dropbox link. I highly recommend you printing this out and taking the time to read it. It's a 40 page document, but it goes so in depth on, you know, on gutters, vents, windows, doors, all things that you can do to harden your home. I cannot recommend this document enough. I think it's a really great read and it's something that you can definitely share with others. And let me just, I just lost this. Okay, perfect. But yes, I highly recommend you just taking the time and going through this website and just checking out all the different things that they have. There's a bunch of NFPA resources on there and fact sheets, things that you can print out and walk around your home doing. But I really recommend it. And we're gonna be referring to IBHS's research a lot in this program. So now we're gonna be talking about hardening the home within the home ignition zone. And we're gonna first start with the immediate zone. So zone one, which is the zero to five. So the immediate zone consists of the home itself and the non-combustible area around the home. So not only is it the zero to five, it's the actual structure itself. And the areas that we're gonna be focusing on and talking about today are roof materials, rain gutters, eaves, air circulation vents, skylights, windows, exterior walls and sidings, and exterior attachments. And it's going to be very overwhelming because we're going to be giving you a lot of information, but it's really important to know that this is a step-by-step -step process. You need to just, you know, focus in on one thing. If it's, you know, doing something on the weekend, doing something, you know, on the, like just a random day, it's a process. This is going to be very overwhelming and it can almost be you know, you don't want to do it because you're like, I don't know where to start. Just take it step by step in this information and go from there. So Curtis, I think you were going to start talking with us about the roof materials. Fantastic. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Lauren's correct. This is not uh, something you're going to solve immediately overnight. Taking it one step at a time is going to really be key. Uh, many of you may be considering re-roofing your homes. And that's a perfect opportunity to start hardening the defense in that zero to five space. Your roof is one of the most visible and obvious vulnerable spots of the home because it just covers so much surface area and has so much space for stuff to land. Uh, there's basically a couple of different roof ratings. Uh, most of the um, areas that are gonna be mostly affected by this class are gonna already require a class A roofing. In this area, the most common type of materials tend to be the Spanish tiles, the asphalt tiles, uh, sometimes slate tiles, all perfectly good class A materials. Uh, they're going to be met with an underlayment, like a cap sheet of, of roll on like a felt, and that'll all be adhered to a deck. So it's an op it's a great opportunity uh, when you're doing your re-roof to hire a licensed contractor, uh, obtain the appropriate city uh, or county permit. And that will automatically kick in the requirements for the Class A roofing in the hazardous fire areas. Uh, the roof area is very vulnerable because of just the surface area and all the little nooks and crannies. So just remember, if you're getting a new roof, the Class A rating is already going to be required. So don't worry about that. So if you have an older home and you still have a wood shake roof, you're in a very vulnerable place in terms of allowing embers and little bits of debris to easily catch on fire. Uh, Wood-based roofing materials are very easy to ignite, especially if they were not treated or if it's an older roof and it didn't have any fire resistiveness uh, put in or permeated into the shingles. 
Uh, you can still get fire resistive wood shingles as part of an overall assembly, uh, which will include, include the appropriate felt and roof decking. I would generally try to steer you away from these. They look amazing. Um, the experience that I'm seeing in the field is they just don't last as long and they still tend to be seem to have a lower ignition temperature and a less degree of fire resistance than asphalt shingles or clay tiles or slate tiles. So here again, all sorts of examples, right? You can have a wonderful class A roof, right? Of all the great shingles, you have everything all set up, it's wonderful, but it's gonna really have a hard time keeping your home safe if you don't maintain it. So keeping the pine needles, the oak leaves, the redwood duff, et cetera, off of the valleys, out of the gutters and keeping the roof clean and clear will give your class A roof a great chance of surviving. And it will also reduce that fuel bed area uh, in between the tiles and at the gutters. So all of that also allows for better water flow. You get good drainage, et cetera. So all helpful. And then that also, the drainage helps to keep less debris on the roof to begin with. Uh, and this is where we talked, alluded to a little bit earlier, we talked about getting a good licensed contractor to do your roof. Uh, and not getting those gaps you're seeing here in this uh, Spanish tile roof. All of those little spaces are perfect spots for embers just to blow right in there. And they're just gonna nestle in and eventually they might make their way into the roof deck and then we have a roof fire. And that's really difficult for us to put out, uh, out in the field as I'm sure Chief Fionnoni could attest to. So it's uh, something you wanna avoid. So here's kind of the two different uh, approaches, right? So the one on the left is the improperly installed. It's pretty wide open, right? It doesn't protect you from any embers at all making their way into the roof area or the space versus the one on the right, which is pretty well filled in. Now, nothing's getting in there. So that's, uh, if you have an existing roof and it looks a little bit like the one on the left, uh, you could bring out a roofing contractor to take a look and perhaps seal it up with the appropriate bird stops uh, and, and get it uh, much more ember resistive. So other things, right? Uh, there's lots of little vulnerable nooks and crannies up on the roof, especially where you have little overhangs, little valleys, small dips, uh, areas that are just kind of, uh, they're not gonna get a lot of air and wind circulation. Uh, you know, think of your roof like a car, like the wind's going to pass over the roof and most of the stuff's going to blow off of it. But in these areas where the wind will like to eddy and, and turn around and just kind of create a little small dead space, that's for this debris is really going to want to settle in. So getting up on your roof probably a couple times a year, running maybe a, a, a blower of some sort, sweeping it with a broom, whatever it takes, hand cleaning and getting all of this stuff off going to give your roof a way better chance uh, of protecting your home. Curtis, a question came up. What about steel roofs? Steel roofs are, are considered class A rating. Uh, they have slightly less requirements in terms of some of the felt and underlayment, uh, but as long as they meet the class A rating and you're getting a building permit, um, that would be fine. Um, I don't know that there's any necessarily better or worse drawbacks to a metal roof. Um, Chief Yanoni may want to chime in on this. They sometimes are a little bit more slippery and difficult to operate on for our firefighters. But other than that, I don't know if there's any necessarily benefits or drawbacks to them. Okay, so, and we get this question a lot, the effectiveness of sprinklers on roofs. Chief Yanoni, would you like to touch upon this, this subject? Yeah, interestingly enough, we are starting to see more and more of those out in the wild urban interface area. And I, I completely understand what is taking place. It's these homeowners uh, making that last ditch effort to really try to protect their home when a lot of times they have to evacuate. So they just feel that sense of um, they need to do something. And oftentimes they'll put these sprinklers on the roof and turn on their, their water and leave. Um, the, the reality of it, it's a very ineffective way 
to protect your, your home. It's not even really recognized within the fire service as a truly way to protect the home. Um, and, and then there's also something else to remember, you know, especially when you're out in those isolated areas, water is very valuable. And if everybody has their water in, you're drawing from the main water source that those first responders need to effectively do their job. So I, I you know, I'd be lying if I could look at that picture and don't understand at least why people are doing it. But the reality of it is it's not a very effective method. And that water is better utilized by those first responders coming in with their engines and properly putting applications to the roofs and to the, the other structures around it and the way that we've been trained. So kind of where we're at with that. Great, thank you. So now that we talked about roofs, we're gonna move on to the rain gutters. So rain gutters, I personally think this is something that's very easy to do. The rain gutters are very susceptible to collecting dead debris from redwoods, oak trees, just accumulating over time. And those are hotbeds. So it's basically kindling for embers. So if we can get that out, that's going to, you know, increase our home survivability a lot more. So combustible debris, such as leaves, pine needles can accumulate, like we just talked about. And then debris that accumulates in gutters has a higher chance of igniting in the presence of embers. If debris is ignited, the edge of the roof covering is exposed and it's easier for fire and embers to enter the attic. So if there's if there's vents on the roof that lead into the attic, or like Curtis was saying, if there's roof tiles that have gaps in it, embers can enter that way. So we wanna eliminate any ignition potential in those gutters. So to prevent debris ignition, gutters must be maintained and completely free of leaves, pine needles, and vegetation. And you can see in the picture to the right, um, that's just a really great example of gutters that were completely filled. And then it can be just a weekend a weekend project of just, you know, taking a blower or emptying out those gutters and that home, um, once they cleared out those gutters has a way better chance of surviving in the event of a wildfire. Rain gutters collect rainwater that falls on the roof and redirects it into downspots, which carry it away from the house. Plant debris such as pine needles and leaves can put your home at risk from burning embers unless it's regularly removed from rain gutters. Gutters are traps for burning embers, which can reach your home long before the actual flame front. Cleaning rain gutters regularly eliminates debris buildup, keeps rainwater flowing into the downspot and away from the house, and it increases your home's survivability during a wildfire. Once debris inside the gutter catches fire, the edge of the roof is exposed to flames and extreme heat. Wildfire can destroy a home with a non-combustible roof if burning debris in the rain gutter ignites wood trim or fascia at the roof's edge or wood decking material between the rafters and the roof covering. Rain gutters can also be made from several materials, including steel, copper, aluminum, and plastic. If a burning ember or even radiant heat comes in contact with a vinyl or plastic gutter, pieces that break off or melt and drip can ignite mulch, vegetation, or combustible siding below. Metal gutters won't burn or crack, making them the best choice in fire hazard areas. Rain gutter covers or guards can be added to block debris and reduce the number of cleanings necessary, but they must be maintained regularly to reduce wildfire risk. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about rain gutter recommendations. So something really simple is regularly clean gutters from debris. So that's something, like I said, you can easily do on the weekend or hire somebody to come do and install gutters made of non-combustible materials. You're going to hear us use the term non-combustible at least 10,000 times this, this, uh, this webinar. If you're going to, if you're in the market to replace something, always choose the non-combustible option. They are a little more expensive, but like they, like you saw in the video, if you buy a vinyl or a plastic gutter that that heat from that fire, even if it's not even on your home, that radiant heat could melt that could melt that gutter and then expose um, expose that to the siding or the mulch below it. So we always just want to choose the uh, non-combustible materials. So 
metal, copper, stuff like that, aluminum. Gutter guards or covers can be installed to help main, minimize debris, but must be properly installed and maintained as well as regularly checked for debris. So you can see what a gutter guard is in that bottom picture on the right. So gutter guards are great just because they help minimize the amount of debris that's actually going into the gutter. But just because you put those gutter guards on is not a one and done thing. You have to constantly maintain them. You're going to have to blow off the debris that collects on the top. You're going to have to constantly inspect that gutter, that gutter guard to make sure that there's no punctures or holes in the mesh screening and that it was properly installed. And then you're also just going to want to inspect gutters regularly and reattach or reinstall gutters that are damaged. So if part of your gutter has shifted or is broken or is cracked, you always wanna make sure that that's maintained. So maintenance is the key on every single thing that we're gonna be talking about today. So going from the gutters, we're now gonna be talking about eaves. So eaves are the transition between the roof and the exterior walls of the home. And there are two types of eaves, and those eaves are open eaves and box eaves. You can see a great example of open eaves um, on the top picture and boxed in eaves on the lower picture. And we're gonna be watching a video which kind of goes more in depth and explain the difference between open eaves and boxed in. So eaves, overhangs, and walls are susceptible to ignition if the eaves are constructed with combustible or non-fire resistant materials. So again, going back to if you're in, if you're rebuilding your house or remodeling or in the market to box in your eaves, always choose the non-combustible material. So windborne embers, convective heat and radiant heat can be trapped under eaves and overhangs, increasing the potential for ignition. So now we're going to watch a video that kind of goes a little more in depth on what you can do to harden those eaves. The eave is the roof area that extends from the home's outer wall to the roof's edge. The primary function of eaves is to prevent rain that falls onto the roof from pouring down the sides of the house. Eaves also protect structure footings from erosion and reduce splatter from rain as it hits the ground. Although eaves were designed to protect your home, open eaves may actually put it at risk. Most homes are damaged or lost in a wildfire as a result of contact with embers not flames. Embers and hot gases can swirl and gather in the area under open eaves or lodge in gaps, cracks, and crevices in the eave area. Either way, open eaves make the roof vulnerable to flaming embers that can damage or destroy your home. You can tell if you have open eaves by checking the underside of the roof from the edge to where it intersects with the wall. If you can see the rafter tails, two inches by four inches or two inches by six inches, you have open eaves. Open eaves are less expensive to construct, but are much more vulnerable to embers than boxed eaves. Closing or boxing open eaves protects the eave area by directing hot air and embers away from the home. This is done by enclosing eaves with non-combustible material to create a soffit, which eliminates the vulnerable gap between the side of the house and the edge of the eave. In addition to offering wildfire protection, soffits prevent birds from building nests under eaves, protect roof rafters from termites or other insects, and reduce painting and maintenance costs. If you box your eaves, it's important to vent the soffit to increase ventilation and remove moisture and condensation in the attic space. If you're not sure if there's enough ventilation, check with your local building department. If you have open eaves and are unable to box them in at this time, be sure to seal all gaps, cracks, and crevices in the eave area with caulking material. Maintaining the paint on roof eaves and fascia the trim at the roof's edge is also important. Bare wood ignites much faster than wood with a good coat of paint. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the different types of eaves and kind of recommendations on what you should do if you have either or. So if a home has open eaves, the roof rafters and roof sheathing are visible. So you can see in the picture to the right, you can see those boards that are exposing those rafters, so that's open eaves. 
So open eave designs trap heat in the under eave area. And if ignition occurs, the fire spreads more quickly and mostly because it's, it is made out of non-combustible materials because you have the, the wood underneath it. So open eaves are susceptible to ignition if the eaves are constructed with combustible or non-fire resistant material. And to mitigate ignition potential, consider framing open eaves with boxed in eave design. And what we're going to keep repeating after over and over on each one of these sections, if you're in the market to replace it, definitely look into non-combustible options and how to harden that home. But if you can't replace it, it's just honestly just maintenance, making sure that there's no rotting boards, making sure that you have a fresh coat of paint. There's a lot of really cost effective ways that you can help harden your home. You don't have to replace everything in your home and make it this hardened fortress. Just start by doing those little things and maintain those and main, um, maintain the structural integrity of you know the boards and no decay and stuff like that. So boxed in eaves are the better design for hardening the home. Um, box in eaves enclose the underside of the sloped or flat roof overhang. So you can see in this picture right here that it's boxed in. Roof rafters and sheathing are hidden through the use of panels or boards that extend horizontally from the edge of the roof. And boxing in the eaves prevents heat from being trapped in the under eave area. So for best eave protection, boxed in eaves with non-combustible materials, the way to go. But again, like I said, if you don't have the means to redo the whole house or box in all those eaves, just honestly, just maintain it, make sure there's no decay, make sure you're cleaning out all the bird's nests that can, that can um, go accumulate underneath those eaves and just maintain it. And Chief Inoni, I think you were going to talk to us about air circulation vents. Yeah, it just kind of leads right into it. So in regards to a mixed air, air circulation vents, whether you have boxed in eaves and you have soffit vents or you have crawl space vents for underneath your house or you have the gable vents into your attic or the roof vents, vents are great. Um, as it's stated, they, they create you know, good, good airflow you know, to combat the stale air. air. They keep heat in, they keep the moisture out, but it's, it's super important that these vents have um, metal vents and or mesh screens on them. And those screens need to be made of metal. So that's really important with all these vents. I think this is a video that talks a little bit about it. Attic, roof, foundation, and soffit vents are designed to remove moisture and condensation in cooler months and reduce excess heat in warmer months. Unfortunately, vents can also provide entry points for burning embers. Once inside, embers can ignite construction materials and other flammable items, allowing a wildfire to enter the attic or crawl space long before the flame front reaches your home. Covering vents with 1 8 inch metal mesh screens or replacing them with ember resistant baffle vents is an important part of any home hardening plan. This display simulates three sizes of screens with proportioned wood chips representing fire embers. Although one quarter inch screens might prevent birds and rodents from entering through vent openings, burning embers can pass through and spread fire to the inside of the home. Screens made from 1 16th inch mesh can easily become plugged with dust, paint, or plant debris, which can reduce their ability to control moisture and room temperature. Covering vents with 1 8 inch non-combustible, corrosion-resistant metal mesh screens offers wildfire protection, as well as removing moisture and reducing heat in attic or crawl spaces. More maintenance is required to keep 1 8 inch mesh free of debris, but the benefits far outweigh the efforts. For additional protection, consider preparing vent covers that can be temporarily installed when a wildfire approaches your home. Vent covers can be made from plywood or even aluminum foil folded several layers thick and stapled in place. An alternative to vent screens is the installation of baffle vents designed to resist flames as well as embers. Vents made of plastic and fiberglass are also available 
but should not be used in areas prone to wildfire because they can burn or melt when exposed to flames or radiant heat. Okay. So as, in regards to exterior events, some of the recommendations that, that we like to tell folks is, is one, the building code requires a minimum of 1 16th inch. And I believe that's just kind of in this area. Is that correct, um, Curtis, in thinking that? Um, it may be different with other building codes, but at least in this area, that's it requires 1 16th inch uh, mesh screening as a maximum and uh, a quarter inch for, um, for some of the screening, I believe, is the breakdown for that, right? Correct. That's correct. Okay. That's out of the local California building code. But there's pros and cons to, to each each one of those. If um, if you're going with a quarter inch, one fourth inch mesh screens, they as they talked about, they tend to be a less effective, maybe too big. Some of those embers that we talked about have the tendency to get through. Um, so it's not really one of the ones that we strongly recommend. And the one sixteenth inch is the opposite side of that. They while they will still protect they tend to get clogged up um, and will stop airflow. So going with the 1 8 inch screen um, is really good uh, recommendation in regards to using on the soffits, the crawl spaces, um, your gable vents and, and your roof vents. And Curtis, that's a pretty cost-effective um, thing that a homeowner can do to replace just the screening in the vents, am I correct? Yeah, absolutely, super cost-effective. Um, I'm, I haven't been to the hardware store for one of these in a while, but I think you're talking in the neighborhood of five to fifteen dollars a piece, and just running around the house and changing them out and all the vent uh, space is a great way to go. I'm not sure it's a weekend project, Lauren, but you know maybe it's a two weekend project. <laughs> two weekend project. A question came up regarding um, solar panels. Um, do those also trap embers? And maybe Chief Yanoni or Curtis, you can speak to that. Well, I think uh, in general, yeah, anytime you have anything else on your roof and you create little nooks and crannies, yeah, they can trap embers. In California, the solar panels are required to have fire resistive rate of listings. Uh, and if it's on a class A roof, you probably have a good chance of surviving that one. Uh, but yes, there's nothing that prevents pine needles or other leaf debris from gathering in the connection points between the panels and the roof. So it is another thing to maintain. So when you're up there wiping off the solar panel so you get the most sun, don't forget to clean underneath it between the panel and the roof. And I think you bring up a great point there is that whether you like it or not, we need to maintain our roofs and or have someone do it for us because some of our roofs, the pitches may be steeper than others. And it could be a safety issue for someone to be up there and do it. But it is important that we do keep the roofs clean. So um, regardless of what you have up there. Yeah, these all these projects are definitely not a one and done. It's a you have to constantly be checking your roofs, your gutters, your your vents. You have to constantly be inspecting it in order to have that best protection. All right, so now we're going to be moving on to skylights. So skylights um, can also be another vulnerable thing that can be on the roof, and they can be vulnerable if debris accumulates in the intersection between the skylight and the roof. So you can see in a couple of these pictures, just debris are collecting up around that um, skylight frame. If a debris accumulates on the top of skylights, so whether it be on top of the glass or on top of the plastic, or if you see in this picture, the third picture in, that's a very steep pitch roof. So debris can definitely get caught up along the top of that as well. Um, it can be vulnerable if the fixed uh, roof dome is made out of plastic. So the second picture in these plastic skylights, again, they're great because they're cost effective, but in a wildfire that just it can be just radiant heat that not even flames on the roof and that skylight can melt and then that will create an opening for more embers to enter your home. So again, the non-combustible tempered glass is the way to go. And um, the, you wanna make sure that the frame is constructed um, of non-combustible materials. So it's vulnerable if it is combustible. So you can see in this first picture, it looks like they have a glass skylight, which is great, but the frame of that skylight is made out of wood, which it looks pretty damp here, but we're in a drought now. So a lot of those boards are dried out and 
are just waiting to have an ember come flying up next to it to help ignite it. So we just wanna make sure that we do all non-combustible materials. So a great example would be this picture on the far right of that non-combustible um, metal uh, frame. It looks like they have uh, a glass um, skylight, but they would just wanna clear out that debris. So recommendations is to regularly clear debris buildup around the skylight. I'm sensing a, a maintenance theme to this webinar. Um, skylight should be constructed with tempered glass. Frame should be constructed with non-combustible materials like we've talked about. And replace wood frame skylights with metal frames or install metal flashing to protect from ember intrusion. So again, if you're not in the market to completely replace that skylight, just adding that, you know, couple inches of metal flashing could really, you know, help, help protect your home and help protect that, um, help for help protect that skylight from getting compromised. And then again, you want to make sure if you have operable skylights, so skylights that open, you're going to want to screen them just like we talked about with those air circulation vents. We want that one eighth inch mesh so that if you some, if you left or you evacuated and that skylight was forgotten about and left open, at least you'll have that, that one eighth inch mesh screening to help protect it from embers entering your home. Which leads us, leads us into windows. So heat from wildfire can cause window glass to fracture, exposing the home to embers and flames. So single pane and large windows are the most vulnerable. You can see in this uh, top picture, this is a single pane window and it looks like it got too hot and that glass popped. And then that's just a, basically a huge open gap allowing embers to come into your home. So to reduce the risk of window glass failing or collapsing, you want to install double or triple pane tempered glass windows. You want to ensure window panes are made of non-combustible material. So again, you want that metal, aluminum um, uh, framing. You want to install wire mesh window screens. Those can improve the performance of the windows that are subjected to radiant heat exposures. And window failure can also occur if the window frame material ignites. And we're gonna be talking, uh, you're gonna be watching a video and then we're gonna talk about some recommendations. So if you can replace your windows or you're going to replace your windows, definitely get those double paned, um, even if it's just one window at a time. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what you can do if you're not in the market to uh, change out all of your windows. Extreme heat during a wildfire can cause window glass to fracture and collapse, giving embers and flames easy access to your home's interior. Fire can also burn through window frames made from combustible material and ignite curtains or other home furnishings. Your home's survivability may depend on your window's ability to resist radiant heat and direct flame contact. If your home has single pane windows, replacing them with dual pane windows will help defend it from an approaching wildfire. The outer pane protects the inner pane by serving as a thermal shield, which may keep it from breaking even if the outer pane breaks. Using tempered glass for one or both panes adds another level of wildfire protection. Tempered glass is more expensive, but it's up to four times stronger than traditional glass and resists breaking when exposed to intense heat. Window frame materials should also be considered when taking steps to protect your home from wildfire. Metal frames are inexpensive, strong, lightweight, and almost maintenance free. They're fire resistant, making them a good choice for wildfire protection. Vinyl, fiber class, wood, and wood composite window frames are also available, and each material has advantages, but none of them are fire resistant. Protecting windows makes a big difference in the overall safety of every home in an area prone to wildfires. Maintaining vegetation to keep it low and away from windows should always be part of your vegetation management plan but it's especially important if you have single pane windows with non-tempered glass or flammable window frames. 
Okay, so to reduce the risk of glass failure or collapsing of the windows, you're going to want to replace single pane windows with double or triple pane tempered glass windows. And again, windows are very expensive, but you this is something that you can do over a period of time. So if you have one portion of your house that's due for a window upgrade, just kind of working in sections, um, you can install wire mesh screening behind those windows in order to help ember intrusion. And you want to ensure that the window panes are made of non-combustible material. So again, that metal non-combustible. And then you want to maintain or eliminate vegetation around windows. And that's especially important if you have single pane windows or non-tempered glass, or you can't replace your windows. You just want to make sure that you eliminate anything that's combustible around that, that could have direct flame contact or have radiant heat um, get sent through those windows to, um, that could compromise them. So again, it's just maintenance. So now we're going to be moving on to exterior walls and siding. So exterior siding is used to help to protect the home from strong weather elements. In a wildfire, exterior walls are susceptible to enders, flames, conductive, and radiant heat. And installing fire-resistant or non-combustible siding can greatly increase the chance of a home surviving a wildfire. And this picture is one of my favorite pictures to show, and we're actually going to be watching a short video clip on it in a little bit. But this is from IBHS, so the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And they have this really awesome research center where they have these huge ember generators that mimic the embers that would, um, the ember casts that a wildfire would give off. And so they actually constructed a home within one of their research facilities and they divided it in half. And the left side they made with combustible siding. They didn't have the zero to five clearance of non-combustible materials. And they made a completely other side of non-combustible siding and following all of the home hardening um, topics that we're talking about today. And um, it's just, it's very fascinating to me as to the results of this. So we're gonna watch that video later, but we're gonna be talking about the siding as in, as you can see this, um, the non-combustible or the combustible siding on here did not fare well. During a wildfire, your home's exterior walls are at risk from radiant heat, burning embers, and direct flames. Wood products such as boards, panels, and shingles are common siding materials, but because they're combustible, they're not a good choice in areas prone to wildfires. If your home has combustible siding and you're not ready or able to replace it, regular maintenance should be part of your home hardening plan. Replace any materials in poor condition and seal gaps and cracks in siding and trim materials with a good quality caulk to keep burning embers out during a wildfire. Proper vegetation management is also important if your home has combustible siding because it will reduce exposure from direct flames or radiant heat. Wall materials that resist heat and flames include cement board, plaster, stucco, and concrete masonry such as stone, brick or block. Vinyl doesn't burn and resists termites and other insects, but flames or even high temperatures will cause it to melt and fall away from the home, exposing combustible materials behind it to flames or radiant heat. Stucco is ember resistant, making it a good choice for homes at risk for wildfires. Masonry is also ember resistant, durable and versatile. Brick and stone provide an excellent sound barrier and can reduce heating and cooling costs by providing insulation to exterior walls. Cement board is another ember resistant siding material. No building material can guarantee a fireproof structure, but investing in non-combustible siding will help prevent your home from the next wildfire. Okay, so now we're going to talk about kind of the different types of siding that we come in contact with in this area. And when I talk to people, I like to tell them like your site, the siding of the house is like your skin. It covers the most surface area and we want to make sure that we have the best protection possible. So combustible sidings are more vulnerable to ignition. So just like the wood shake roofs that we talked about for roofing materials, if you have wood shake siding, 
that puts you in a more vulnerable um, situation. So combustible sidings provide a path for flames to reach other vulnerable components of the home. So under eaves and the windows. And if you have this siding, you just wanna make sure that you're incorporating a non-combustible zone next to the home. So it reduces the home's vulnerability. So it's gonna reduce the amount of flames and radiant heat that are coming up to your home. So if you have that wood shake siding, it's so, so, so important that you have so much clearance of non-combustible um, area around your home. Okay, and then also installing metal flashing to protect, to protect combustible siding from ember exposure. This is huge. So you can see in this picture to the left, so they have, a, they have a class A roof, which is awesome. It looks like they have combustible siding. Um, so here you can see that the paint is chipping off, exposing some of that, um, the boards over there. I don't, I'm not sure if it's rotting. It could be, but then you can also see there's this gap right along the roof line and where the siding meets. And that's a perfect area for debris to collect and for embers to kind of find that and kind of bet embed themselves there and kind of live there for a little bit until they decide to ignite. So if you can replace that, that's awesome. If not, installing metal flashing, just like this picture on the right, is another really great um, choice that you can do, a cheaper choice um, to uh, help protect that, um, that siding and that, um, that crack where the roof and the wall join together. Vinyl siding. We haven't seen much of this around here, but it, does, it, it, it very well could be. So vinyl siding, again, vinyl is, not com is, um, is combustible and it warps when there's heat around it. You, you know, you can, it can be a hot day and vinyl can sometimes warp. So, and that deforms and falls off and you can see that it exposes, um, it exposes the wall here, which makes it super vulnerable and susceptible for embers to come in and, and ignite that. So we really try to tell people to steer away from vinyl siding. Log siding. So log sidings are um, large wood members such as those used in log house houses. And those are more difficult to ignite. They are made out of wood, but just the sheer size of them, it makes them a little harder for those embers to penetrate. So the most vulnerable part of a log wall is between the logging joints. So the picture on the left does a pretty good job. There's not real, so the joints are pretty tight here. And then along the sides of the home, it looks like they have some metal flashing um, covering those ends. But if you look at the picture on the right, it looks like they have really great um, tight boards where they have the chinking in between. But as you can see, these exposed um, ends of the logs, there are some gaps. And that's just something that if you do have a home that's like that, you're going to want to make sure that you go in with a blower and make sure that there's no debris collecting um, where embers can, you know, go in and, and nestle and ignite the home that way. And then non-combustible exterior, exterior siding. So these are the options that we recommend to people. Um, so the fiber cement, the traditional three coat stucco, masonry, those are all really great um, non-combustible fire resistant materials. And so those are the ones that, you know, you're going to want to look into. And now we're going to actually go into um, exterior attachments. So what I like to tell people is if it's touching your home, you need to consider it part of your home. If you have fences that come in and touch your home on both sides, you need to consider that entire fence a part of your home, because if that fence gets compromised or it ignites, that's just leading it to your home. So you want to treat those exterior attachments like they are part of your home. So landscape fences and walls function as physical or visual barriers, but they can contribute to the spread of wildfire if they're made with combustible material. So fencing within the immediate zone one, so the zero to five feet, should be constructed of non-combustible materials. So you can have a wood fence, but just make sure that those parts in that zero to five, so the gate that's touching your home, look into having a non-combustible option. You wanna break that chain, um, that ignition chain. 
So non-combustible fencing reduces the chance of a burning fence igniting the exterior of the home. So as you can see in this top picture, that has the combustible fence. It doesn't look like this fence was touching the home itself, but you can see that that home has vinyl siding and just the heat coming off of that fence has melted that siding, which is exposing very vulnerable parts of the home. And the home, even though the fire's not touching it, could potentially ignite if an ember pops off and nestles somewhere in there. So you really wanna make sure that one, you have the non-combustible siding and two, if that person did have a gate, making sure that that gate is made out of a non-combustible material. Some fence materials are beautiful, but offer no privacy. Others are designed to keep animals out. The type of fence you have may depend on whether a fence offers wildfire protection or increases the risk. If you live in an area prone to wildfires, finding solutions for hazardous fence issues should be part of your home hardening plan. A wood fence is vulnerable to embers and direct flame contact. Once on fire, a wood fence attached to or near your home can spread fire to the building. Plastic fences are more fire resistant than wood fences, but the extreme heat can cause it to melt. Metal is durable and is fire resistant, but a chain link or barbed wire fence can't block heat, embers, or flames. Also, fire can travel along the fence toward the home if plant litter or other combustible material has built up in or around it. Non-combustible materials such as metal, brick, concrete, or stucco requires very little maintenance and provides the most wildfire protection. It won't block windblown embers flying above the height of the fence, but will deflect flames and protect your home from radiant heat. No fence material can offer complete wildfire protection, but there are steps you can take to increase the level of protection your fence provides. Consider non-combustible materials, ignition resistant wood if you're adding or replacing a fence. Wood framing and wire mesh can also be combined to reduce the amount of combustible material in the fence. If you have a fence made from combustible material, add a non-combustible gate or fence section between the fence and your home to keep them at least 10 feet apart. Create a one inch gap at the bottom of the fence to prevent fence boards from touching the soil. Direct contact can cause rot and decay, which makes the wood more flammable. Keep the fence line clear of plant debris. Never store combustible materials such as firewood against a combustible fence. Avoid wood slat fences with gaps. Burning embers that get trapped in gaps will ignite the fence, increasing your home's vulnerability. Okay, so they gave some really great recommendations within that video. So the first recommendation is install non-combustible fencing to reduce the chance of, home, of the home igniting. And again, if you're in the market to do that, or if you're building a new home, definitely look into the non-combustible options. But if you aren't in the market for a new fence, there are things that you can do to help maintain that fence to make sure that it's in the best possible condition. So making sure that there's no rot at the bottom, making sure that all vegetation is completely off of it. And then maybe just installing that non-combustible fence within that first zero to five is a really great um, option if you do have a combustible fence. Um, ensuring, yeah, like we just said, ensuring that the fence gate within the immediate zone one is non-combustible. And then removing vegetation, removing debris that collects along the fence line, and just making sure, they, like they said, making sure that firewood is not put up against the fence. We unfortunately see a lot of that up in the hills from people are collecting firewood. We know that it's convenient to put it right next to your home to go in and out of the home, but you really need to make sure that you have that firewood away from it. Another thing that I like to tell people is make sure that your trash cans aren't up against your home or up against the fence where they can ignite and spread that way. So making sure that your trash cans are are farther away from your home. Those are all things that, you know, they seem really small, but 
that that could be the difference between your house surviving or your house not. So just making sure that, you know, you do everything that you can to help prevent um, that if that fence is ignited to travel to that home. So we just want to break that chain. And then on top of fences, we also see a lot of decks. So decks made from combustible materials can easily ignite from embers or flame exposure. So decks that ignite expose the home to radiant heat or direct flame contact. Using non-combustible materials may help protect the home during a wildfire. And decks made from combustible materials uh, require a uh, regular maintenance. So these pictures are again from IBHS uh, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And I just think that they're such really great, vi they're great visuals. So the top picture shows um, embers entering through the deck. So it's really imperative that when you have a deck that you're constantly maintaining it and cleaning it from debris because those deck boards those pine needles, those redwood needles, those oak leaves, they can all fall down in there. And if you're not regularly clearing out underneath that deck, you're basically, it's a hotbed of, of just dry, dead vegetation. And that's what embers love. So you can see this, um, this deck on top, those embers are going through those deck boards, but they're just going directly into a bed of dry, dead vegetation. And the picture on the bottom, you can see that that dry, dead vegetation is now ignited and now underneath the deck is being exposed to direct flame contact. And I can guarantee you that that deck will, will ignite. And then because that deck would most likely be attached to a home, that that home would ignite as well. So deck maintenance is super imperative when you, when you have one. A balcony or deck that catches fire will provide radiant heat and or direct flame contact to your home's exterior walls, windows, and doors. Depending on the flammability of the construction materials, flames might spread to the eaves or roof. What the balcony and decks are made from, what's stored on or below them, and how well the vegetation around your home has been maintained are important factors that may determine whether a wildfire destroys your home or passes it by. If you have plans for adding a balcony or deck, using non-combustible materials may help protect your home during a wildfire. Metal masonry and lightweight concrete are non-combustible, durable, and low maintenance. Wood and wood-based products are also available that qualify as ignition resistant if they've been treated with a fire retardant. Ignition resistant materials aren't non-combustible, but they provide better fire protection than combustible materials. If you have an existing balcony or deck made from flammable material, regular maintenance is necessary to reduce wildfire risk. This includes keeping surface areas free of plant debris. Debris that builds up in gaps between deck boards or on top of the balcony or deck can be easily ignited by windblown embers or even radiant heat. Burning debris may ignite the balcony or deck, spreading to your home. Embers can ignite the deck if they land in the gap between the deck and the exterior wall. Sealing the gap with a quality caulk or metal flashing lessens fire risk and moisture that can lead to rot. Combustible items stored on or under the balcony or deck put your entire home at risk. Moving firewood at least 30 feet from your home and other structures and furniture made from fire resistant or non-combustible material will improve your home's survivability during the next wildfire. Enclosing or screening the underside of the deck with non-combustible material may reduce debris buildup. This is important if the area under the deck is used for storage or if the deck is located on the hillside where it can trap heat, embers, and flames. Keep in mind that an enclosed deck will need proper ventilation to prevent moisture damage. Enclosing the underside of the balcony with non-combustible material may also help protect your home during a wildfire. If burning embers and heat are trapped underneath and ignite the subflooring, fire can spread to the balcony and into the home. Protecting your home from wildfire takes vegetation management as well as home hardening. 
A balcony or deck made from combustible material has a much better chance of surviving if you have reduced vegetation within 100 feet of your home, followed guidelines for horizontal and vertical separation, and replace highly combustible plants with plants that are fire resistive. Okay, so they just gave a lot of really great recommendations on what you can do to help harden your deck. So first, just replacing combustible decks with non-combustible materials, and that's if possible. Again, if you're rebuilding or if you're building a new home or it's that time to replace your deck, definitely look into non-combustible options. That's not always feasible. So when that's not feasible, we're gonna look more at the maintenance side of that deck. And that's keeping the deck surface area and deck boards clear of debris. You can see in some of these pictures, that first picture, you can see debris building up along the deck boards. You see that debris is building up along the deck and then the exterior of the home. And it looks like that that home has um, a combustible siding. And it also looks like the deck boards are not well maintained. They're, they're, the paint's peeling up, exposing some really dry materials. So they would want to either put that, met, they want to put that metal flashing and then also um, sand down that deck and repaint it. Sealing the gaps between the deck and exterior siding with caulking or metal flashing. So just what I just said. And then removing all combustible items stored on or under balconies and decks. This is a really big one. So making sure that there's no combustible items on that deck. So there are a lot of really great and really attractive um, uh, dining furniture sets and chairs and all that that are made out of non-combustible materials. Um, that's something that you really going to look into making sure that you don't put, um, potted plants right up against the side of your home. You want to really make sure that there's no combustible materials, um, on that deck. And then also we do see a lot of it, especially up in the Hills. Um, those decks that are on that top layer, that double decker deck, you see a lot of storage under those decks. So we really try to tell our residents that you should not be storing materials under those decks. I know it's very convenient. A lot of times it's behind the home, so it's out of sight, out of mind, but it's really important that you keep all combustible materials out from underneath those decks. And then again, making sure that your firewood is not stacked under those decks and it's stacked at least 30 feet away from the home. And then once you've done that, if you do want to enclose the underside of your deck, or if you need to use that deck for storage, you can enclose the underside of the deck. Um, just make sure that you're using um, really good materials. So you can see there's a really good example in this far right picture. There's no gaps. There might be some, um, some circulation vents on the other sides of it but it's fully closed. We do see people who try to close the undersides of their deck um, to keep critters out, not so much for wildfire protection. And you see the big lattice that you can get, the wood lattice. We really refrain people from using that one because those are huge holes that embers could get in. And then also it doesn't allow you to go in and clear out from under your deck, clear all the debris out under your deck. So if you're going to enclose it, make sure that you, it's um, made out of non-combustible material. And then if you don't enclose it, making sure that you're constantly clearing out the debris that collects underneath the deck. And then not only just do you wanna clear out the debris that's underneath the deck, you wanna make sure that the vegetation around that deck is also maintained too. So if you have tree limbs that are coming over off of a tree that are hanging over your deck, they might be really pretty, but that's gonna leave a lot of leaf litter. If that tree were to ignite, then that could extend um, the flames and radiant heat to your home that could compromise it. Um, you wanna make sure that there's no vines growing up it. You really wanna uh, make sure that that vegetation is, um, is managed around that deck. So we just covered a lot of information about the immediate zone. Like I said, it could seem very overwhelming of, you know, you might've been writing a running list of things that you're gonna wanna do um, to help harden your home. Cause we did cover a lot. We covered roof materials, rain gutters, eaves, air circulation vents, skylights, windows, walls, sidings, fences, decks. 
This is all something that you can just write on a running to-do list. Just slowly check it off. Maybe this month you're going to focus on your roof. And then maybe next month you'll focus on, oh, I'm going to replace the mesh screens. This is all stuff that you can do in chunks. Um, and we want you to feel like you can. It's totally doable. Um, just putting in a little sweat equity into your home. And it's honestly, it's the small things that could help save your home there. You know, it could just be doing the rain gutters or maintaining the vegetation around your home. There's a bunch of different factors that could help save your home. And the fact that you're taking this class is a really great first step and shows us that, you know, there's interest in people wanting to help harden and protect their homes from these wildfires. And this is a totally doable task. It requires, um, a constant, you know, thought, like thinking about doing it. It's not one and done. Like we said before, it's a constant maintenance, um, regimen, but it's totally doable. And so now we're going to watch the video that I was talking about earlier about, um, the one from the insurance Institute for business and home safety and their Ember generators showing the difference between, um, what happens when embers come in contact with the house that, follows the home hardening and one that does not. So from start to finish, we're gonna start with our ember generators, which we use to recreate a realistic ember exposure. Embers are those small burning and smoldering particles that may travel ahead of the fire front. And what we do with our generators, we create the realistic exposure and in our wind tunnel, we're able to throw them at a building. And then we have a building that has two sides to it, a good side, which uses wildfire resistant construction, and what we're considering a typical building that we would see in a wildfire prone area. Exactly as we expected, that mulch on the ground there caught fire from the embers. The fire from the mulch burned up under this, this deck, and this whole deck was on fire. And so this fire on this deck caused flames right against the home. And then if we look there at the base of the door, there was actually the flames from this deck that burned through the bottom of the door. And on the inside of the house, we started to see smoke and flames. And so because this deck was a combustible material attached to the building, when the embers led to the ignition of this deck, we got flames inside of the building. Here we are on the wildfire resistant side of the house where we had non-combustible siding, a five foot non-combustible zone and six inch gap. We had a metal gutter and multi-pane windows. And we see in comparison to the non-wildfire resistant side, this side had the same ember exposure. If you look here in the mulch, you can actually see some of the embers that had accumulated, but because they had no susceptible fuel to ignite, they just landed there and fizzled out. Now here where we have ornamental vegetation, that again is susceptible to the embers, but because it's more than five feet away from the home, it didn't have enough energy to ignite and it never led to a flame impact on the building. So, I just think that that's such a fascinating video um, and it's really impactful to see, you know, just that if you do put in the effort into your home and making sure that your home is hardened and has that zero to five combustible area that it does have um, a way bigger survivability rate. Um, and that again is from the IBHS website. And I highly encourage all of you. I know that it, um, the link was put in the chat and we'll also be sending that link to you in the Dropbox. Um, for you just to go check it out. There's a lot more videos like that. Um, and so I really highly recommend you taking the time to go through those. So um, just to wrap up the immediate zone one. So for maximum protection, harden the home and also maintain a non-combustible ignition resistant area within the first five feet of the home. So gravel, concrete, pavers, Again, we live in a time now that you can just go on Google or Pinterest and look up non-combustible zero to five. And there's so many attractive um, ways to do that now. It doesn't have to be just a concrete fortress. So really look into that. 
um, making sure that all combustibles and readily ignited materials should be removed from that zero to five. So your house could be compromised some, from something as small as a doormat, surface litter, firewood, lumber, patio furniture, mulch. We're gonna talk about mulch a, a little more in depth in the next section and vegetation. Even just, you know, having a broom leaning up against your home that's combustible could ignite your home. So we really stress that that zero to five needs to be non-combustible. And then removing trees and shrubs or um, within that zero to five and replacing it with succulents or again, that hardscaping. Hi, Lauren, there's a question about um, how much is mulch of a concern in the zero to five and five to 30 feet zones? Oh, perfect. Um, I believe Curtis is going to cover that in just a few slides, and um, he has a lot more information. We'll also be providing you with a mulch study in the Dropbox link, which is also a fascinating read um, that kind of picks apart the different types of mulches. And then Curtis, I think we're going to take it away with you to talk about the intermediate zone too. And I think to start us off, we have a, a short video. It's pretty emotional. It's so clear when you look at it that the wood mulch burned and it stopped at the gravel. And if it hadn't been for the gravel, it would have burned right up to the edge of the house. And would it burned the house? I don't know, but it wouldn't have been good. You know, you just, I think you just can't pretend this is this area is the way it was 30 years ago when it was early in its life. It, we're having wildfires now. I think we have to change the way we think about landscape. You see the world differently once you've experienced wildfire and having to run from it. You, you see what's flammable. Uh, as a designer and contractor, I used to think about whether it was aesthetically pleasing and highly functional. But highly functional has taken on a much higher level now. Is it functional for a wildfire? The thing that has struck me over this last couple of weeks was some sense of peace that at least we tried, at least we did something. And, and as it turns out, what we did mattered. Lauren, a great video. Um, so I'll slightly address um, the bark, tan bark, mulch question just right up front so people don't have to wait and we'll cover a little bit more in detail. But in a nutshell, having that mulch or that combustible material in that zero to five feet is a big concern. Uh, you really need to pull it out and get into a non-combustible gravel, rock, California gold, river rock, something of that nature. Uh, that would be my absolute recommendation. Uh, we're really gonna dive into uh, the true weekend projects where we're gonna talk about limiting the amount of vegetation in that five to 30 zone. So we want everything in this area to be well-maintained, well-landscaped, watered, cared for, pruned, et cetera. Now, this is an area of your home where if something does ignite, it can then cast little embers and little stuff onto your home and start a fire right on your home, just right from the property line, right immediately. We're not talking something miles away, right? This is something immediately near your home, you can do something about. Uh, this is the spot where your house is gonna look the best, the cleanest, and this is gonna be the most well-maintained and watered. So here's the mulch we talked about in the study that Lauren was alluding to. Nothing's gonna be in that zero to five feet. The picture of the material you see there on the right, that's the stuff you're gonna wanna avoid in the zero to five. When we get a little bit farther out from the house, that's sort of five to 30, you can start introducing mulch. Uh, I generally recommend nothing more than two to four inches in depth. Um, and that's based on a whole bunch of criteria that where you're trying to balance, right? The risk of having combustible material with the benefits of erosion protection and uh, moisture control, keeping you know, when you water plants, right, keeping the ground moist so that the plants have more moisture and are healthier and more vibrant. So it is a bit of a balance. 
Uh, I recommend as much as you can to not use any of this material on your property, but if you have to, having it farther away from the house as possible and having it being very shallow depth. The study that is alluded to there, um, you can see just even a fairly small amount, right, can burn right up to the house. You saw the video uh, where the, the lady there had the gravel on the ground and she didn't have any of this combustible material. It may have made all the difference in saving her home. So uh, and the answer, short answer is none in the zero to five. And I would really limit it beyond the house uh, in the five to 30 and the 30 to 100. Yeah, and um, that link to that study for the mulch has also just been placed in the chat. But again, like I said, that will be um, sent to you via the Dropbox. And then going back to that video that we just watched, I really like to you know stress to people too, if you look at her home in, in that video, not all of it is hardened there you know there's a doormat there's vegetation up against her wall but they did put in effort and they did change out that um, mulch into gravel so they did do something and that their home survived so any little thing that you do it doesn't have to again doesn't have to be a completely hardened fortress but um anything that you do can help um your the survivability of your home So as we push out, right, from the zero to five, right, we want to get into making sure that the landscaping is in really good order. Right now, a lot of plants are stressed with drought. So making sure that you're keeping the plants that you really want to keep well watered, keeping your trees well irrigated. Uh, as plants may die just because of age or through drought, you're going to want to remove them. You're also going to want to remove any dead branches, uh, dead undergrowth, et cetera, all of that is much more vulnerable to ignition than living green material. Uh, it's another great step to take if you really get into more fire resistive plants. Uh, some of the California natives, while they do need fire and will use fire to reproduce and spread, they also tend to be a little more drought resistant. So that's a little bit of a balancing act as well. There's a great link here at the bottom of this page, uh, which helps give you some ideas of some landscaping hints uh, and making some good choices for plants around your home. Uh, it's really also important to remember not just making good choices for plants, but planting them wisely, giving them a little bit of space and gap, right? Not having a full carpet of plants running from let's say, you know, 30 feet out from your home to your house, that's really not a whole lot different than having the tan bark. You can see here in this picture, right? The landscaping is well spaced out. Uh, the plants, very few of them actually touch or create a, like a continuous carpet or path, if you will, for fire. So spacing out, well irrigated, uh, removing the dead material, all gonna be helpful. We'll also be including a fire prone plant list in the Dropbox link as well. So now we're going to get into the part of the, it's getting a little bit more now into sort of range management, right? We're getting 30 feet to 100 feet out from the home. And, you know, these are, you know, we're getting into larger properties. Uh, you can tell in both these pictures, right? We have substantial properties, large homes. The space where you see the area that's not burned is probably pushing, or the bottom house is probably pushing in the 100 to 150 foot range or more. The top house is probably a little bit on that back hillside is probably a little bit less, but I would imagine even though it's burned, the vegetation was probably maintained as low. It probably wasn't full of dead uh, vegetation. Trees were probably pruned up, et cetera. That's where we wanna really talk about kind of the range management. So in this zone, right, we're gonna, of course, get rid of dead vegetation. That's pretty much straightforward in any of the zones. Uh, we're gonna wanna start breaking up trees and shrubs and plants. It doesn't mean remove everything. Uh, you still wanna have a bit of a natural environment and you wanna be able to control erosion and have a, a nice uh, property to look at, but you may have to thin some of the trees. You may have to remove some of the undergrowth to break up that horizontal ladder, right? of a fire moving from sort of on the ground and moving over the ground or a little ember catching and then moving a fire on the ground towards your home. So breaking up the spacing horizontally between trees and shrubs and also uh, raising what I kind of call the browse line, right? So if you imagine a deer 
walking up to a tree and extending its neck uh, and eating whatever it could reach, well, you're going to have this clear browse line of no vegetation where the plant the tree level has been raised up. And what we're trying to do there is break the continuity between the ground and the tree. So if we get a little ground fire going, it has a much harder chance of jumping into the trees and then moving into a more involved fuels. If, and I'm sorry, let's go back one there, Lauren, I apologize. I wanted to hit on this last point. This is a question we get asked quite often, which is if you're gonna get into thinning out canopy or removing trees, you're really gonna probably wanna seek a, a certified arborist to make sure you don't unduly harm or kill the trees. Uh, and if you're gonna do any tree removal or think about it, you're gonna wanna contact your local municipality probably has an arborist or some sort of person who's in charge of managing their tree ordinance, especially in areas where you have oak trees and large populations of native trees. So right, so here's, right, so here's that zero to five, right? You don't really see anything. The five to 30 is that nice landscaped, well irrigated, really tightly maintained. And then we get a little farther out, right? We're still have vegetation, but we're trying to break it up and space it, break up the horizontal, break up the vertical, get rid of the dead growth. I think the real biggest thing, if you can take away from this, is that you really do have the power to make a bit of a difference. Whether, I mean, whether we talk about right whole window and roof replacement, all the way down to, hey, I'm going to rake the dead leaves out from you know underneath that oak tree. Uh, you have the ability to make your house safer, even with little steps. Uh, it's something everyone can do, uh, and if you can't, well, you may have to hire a landscaper to do it. Uh, and they are happy to help get your home just as safe as well. So remember, it's always something uh, that we can all chip in a little bit and uh, make your homes a little bit safer. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to wrap it up that you do have the ability to, you know, help protect your home, even if it's something small. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Chief Yanoni, thank you for taking the time out of your day. And also, um, Curtis, thank you very much. Um, Gina, are there any questions that were in the chat? There are. Let me go back. Uh, Curtis, you might, um, if you can answer this one, what does a home ignition zone inspection include? So right now, if we get calls for home ignition zone inspections, we will come out and do what we call a courtesy wooey inspection. We'll look at the vegetation uh, in from the zero to five and then all the way out through the zones and make recommendations or potentially uh, legal requirements for things to be pruned slash removed. And then we'll make recommendations on the zero to five in terms of all the things that we've talked about in this presentation. But I think more succinctly, we'll try to hit on some of the uh, immediate things. A lot of it is really, as Lauren has talked about, maintenance and the choices we make in terms of where we store things and what kinds of things we store where on the property. So we'll include all of that in our uh, inspection as well. Okay, great. And that is, um, so County Fire will just come out and inspect if your home is um, located within our jurisdiction. Uh, which we serve and protect um, seven different cities and towns um, within Santa Clara County. So if you're outside one of those, then you would contact your respective fire department. Correct. Um, a, another question came in and Chief Yanoni, if you could uh, address this one. I live in a planned development, 10 to 15 houses all connected via the same fence. The fence goes to the wood siding of each of the houses. How much of a risk is this? Any suggestions on how to improve? this in our community. Okay. Well, especially here out here in California, that's not an uncommon uh, residential model that we see um, in the areas that we serve, uh, where we have fences connecting um, from one resident to the other versus when you move back more Midwest, you kind of tend to have open land and less fences. So we run into this quite often. Um, in regards to whether or not that is an, uh, you know, an added uh, hazard to to your property and to your home, 
the fire service works operates off of priorities. So in, in the event that there is a house fire, we will respond and our very first priority is always life safety to make sure you're out and make sure you're safe. The second priority after that becomes exposures. In other words, if one house is on fire and we know everybody's safe, our next priority is making sure that surrounding houses around it don't catch on fire. So without getting into too much detail, we have certain procedures that we do where we would, we would pull hose around both sides of the house and we would protect the house that is an exposure to make sure that the doesn't leak from one house to another. In regards to the fence, we saw a little bit earlier on, anything that is connected to your house can add to the potential for that house to catch on fire, which is why we recommend at least five feet off of your house for it to be a non-combustible material. If it's not, it's okay. It's just one of those things to be mindful. If it's replaced, that is something you can do. What you can do is make sure that you're keeping everything off and away from the fence, right? We're not stacking firewood up. We don't have vegetation that's high and up against the fence. That will add and cause the fire to spread a little bit quicker. Fire in itself on a fence will travel very, very slowly unless it has additional fuel on it to help push it along quickly. You could really hit it with a garden hose and actually knock it out. Um, so it's not so much the fence versus the things that people tend to stack against the fence. And you can only be responsible for your property. You really don't know what your neighbor may be doing on the other side. But if you collectively as a group or a neighborhood are on the same page with fire safety, you should be fine. So. Okay, great. Another question has come in. My house has wood siding, which I cannot replace. Is there a paint I can spray with it? Or if you have any other suggestions? Uh, I'm not intimately familiar with the product, but there are some intumescent paints that you might want to do some research on. It's a type of paint that you can apply to the exterior. And if it's exposed to heat at certain temperatures, essentially, uh, it bubbles up kind of creating like a little air blanket or insulative pocket on the outside of the home. And it's called intumescent paint. Okay. Yeah, I think other than that, you're, you are kind of in a little bit of a bind there in regards to the siding that you do have on that, uh, that specific residential. Um, again, which is why we fall back to some of the tips that we've heard tonight is keep it maintained, manicured, and everything within that first five feet away from your house, make it at least non-combustible. And I think you'll be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. And another question, I think this was um, posed after um, discussing putting sprinklers on the roof, but what if you have a pool or a battery operated pump and a roof water system, any downside to doing that? Maybe Chief Yanoni, you can address that. Well, I don't know so much if there's ever a downside, especially if you're drawing water from your own pool to help protect your own house. Um, I know that your first responders will be grateful because they will also dip into that pool and use that water source as well to help protect your house. So. Um, Again, these are just kind of the recommendations based off of the things that we've seen while I've been out in the field. And just in general, the roof sprinklers don't really, aren't very effective. Um, however, having an extra uh, above ground storage tank of water and or a swimming pool um, with some sort of maybe wharf hydrant or a fire department connection or any other connection that will help supplement um, the water source to help protect your house, I think is great. So pools, I, I'm all for that if you have some sort of system to draw water from your pool to help protect your house. Okay, great. And another question has just come in. Um, how, what about AstroTurf near the home? Is it non-combustible? I don't think I can answer that with 100%. I, I'm not sure. I'm gonna guess it's gonna melt. Yeah, my understanding is most AstroTurf has yeah. got some plastic and some different resins in it. so. I don't think it would be listed as non-combustible. It may be fire resistive if it's listed through the state or through the manufacturer. So it might be one of those sort of intermediary products that it's better than maybe wood mulch, but it may not be as good as, you know, concrete pavers or river rock. Yeah, I would just, I would suggest, you know, just like we said, keeping that zero to five um, completely free of, you know, the AstroTurf and, making sure that that's all non-combustible materials. Other than that, I don't, 
I don't really, can't really talk on that subject. <laughs> Okay, and the next question um, and it revolves around insulation in the attic. So does loose cellulose insulation, such as five or six inches depth, um, or cellulose insulation in the attic make the house more or less susceptible to fire spread? Chief Yanani, maybe you have any information on that? Uh, <clears throat> well, it's a great insulator if, if, if you're talking like a blown in fiberglass insulation or something like that in regards to it being uh, more fire resistive. Um, I, I don't really know. I, it depends on, I would imagine, the square footage of your attic, the, the void spaces within your attic, um, what type of gables you have uh, attached to your attic. Do you have any skylights that would also affect um, any type of uh, flame impingement or attic. So I think a lot of factors go into it. Uh, maybe Curtis, you can speak to it a little bit more in regards to, I don't want the answer around your question, if you're asking specifically about insulation and that being a good fire retardant, um, they, they, it, it, is, it is a manufacturer to be fire resistive, but nothing is fireproof as far as um, insulation goes. Is that correct to say, Curtis? I don't want to misspeak on that. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair statement. And I think the focus wouldn't be so much whether you have a certain kind of insulation in your attic space. The focus I think you would want to get into is the venting and the condition of the roof and all the roof attachments like skylights and gutters and all the things we've talked about today, right? Um, if you're worrying about getting embers inside your attic space, you might want to start maybe looking outward first uh, before worrying about the inside. And I think everything the chief, uh, you know, he said is, is a fair statement. Okay, excellent. This is an, another question that's just come in and as we move to um, more um, homeowners switching to solar, but this one is the solar contractor wants to install a lithium battery against the home exterior wall or the garage. He would like it installed near the property line, 10 feet away from the home. The city does not want it installed near the property line. Any suggestions? Where would the fire department prefer to defend against a lithium battery fire? Well, well I believe I, that's a code, isn't it, Curtis? That's yeah, I, mean, I won't I won't speak on the whole what we would defend portion of the of that question. Mm -hmm. I would leave that to the chief's expertise. But the code allows those batteries to be um, on the home or away from the home. Uh, if they're on the home, they have some opening separation requirements, meaning they have to be far enough away from certain openings that lead into the structure, uh, and they have to be certain spaces apart from each other. Uh, and they are designed to be on the exterior. Uh, they are in rated cabinets, uh, so they're fairly durable and fairly protective. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily a preference, uh, whether they're away from the home or on the home. Uh, that might be an owner's uh, preference. And in terms of defending or fighting a fire for them, uh, I would leave that to the chief's expertise. Well, yeah, and whether whether it's against the house or not, our number one priority for that is securing utilities and making sure that we have the power off so that we can safely fight the, the house fire. And it's a little bit trickier with uh, solar panels and lithium batteries to make sure that we've killed the power appropriately as well as any backup reserves. So um, that would be our main focus is understanding how and making sure we shut the power off to those solar panels. And after that, it's like fight, fighting a regular fire. Okay. I don't see any other questions. I know um, one of the attendees put in a comment regarding the intimacent paints, if you'd like to read up on that um, and his experience with that. But I don't think I see any other um, questions that have been put in the chat. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Um, if you have another question, um, please uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, our contact information has been placed in the chat along with a lot of uh, really good safety information, links and so forth. And again, as Lauren has mentioned multiple times throughout the webinar this evening is all of this information will be shared with you via um, a Dropbox link. So uh, don't worry too much about if you're trying to copy and paste, we'll, we'll get this information to you. Um, um, I don't, 
Oh, I we also, I was just going to um, say too, um, about a month from now, we're going to be sending you all a, a survey monkey question, just a, a single question on what you've um, taken away. And if you've uh, done any of these actions to help harden your home, your feedback is really important to us because it lets us know if the information that we're uh, teaching is being well received. It also lets us know in areas that we need to focus on. So when you get that survey monkey email from our community outreach uh, inbox, please take the time. It's just one question. It will take less than a minute. Um, we would really appreciate that feedback to help better our programs as well. And then we also have um, our Eventbrite page. If you're looking into any more of our classes, we have a lot of uh, really great online virtual classes um, still going on this year. And uh, you can find that at Eventbrite. And then Gina will also put our Eventbrite link in the chat as well, if she has not done so already. Um, but again, thank you so much for uh, letting us come into your homes and teach you this evening. Chief Yanoni, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Same to you, Curtis. We really appreciate you being here. And we hope you all stay safe and we hope you um, have a great evening. So thank you.